Hey everyone, uh, this is Amy Liu and I'm doing a show called Amy Liu Presents, hashtag Amy Liu Presents. My very first guest, my headliner, is actually Christina Wong. Hi, welcome from my couch, my old couch. Hey everybody, I'm, my cowboy motif is going today. Okay. Yeah, so so this is our this is the first live stream of Amy Lou Presents. I'm really excited. Miss Christina Wong has kindly invited us to her home. Because the boba place is too noisy. But uh I have I'm rocking my new ombre, which I see you have also. Yeah, yeah. I, I just feel... I thought I'd try something new. Me too. Know? That's that's what I did. And I I feel a little mixed on it because I feel like it looks like I had brown hair and just let it grow out for it, months. It, because you know how it just all starts yeah, like right yeah, here. Yeah, yeah, started there. Why'd you okay. choose? Why'd you decide to do the ombre? Um, I don't know. I was looking at Yelp reviews for this place across the street, and I was like, "That looks nice." And I've also like when I was in uh, college, I had was so weird looking at myself. <laughs> <laughs> when I was in college, I had like pink hair, I had blonde hair, and uh, I had my nose pierced. And I think I was always trying to be like alternative, alternative. And I thought, wouldn't it be cool if I could rock? just black hair. So for years I just had straight black hair, uh, with bangs and that was, that was it. And, 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 um, cause I felt inside I had like the soul of like a punk rocker, but I, I just didn't look it on the outside. And I was like, what if I let my work speak for itself as opposed to me? Um, like, like I'm different, everyone, I'm different. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And, and also like with the show, Wonk for the Cuckoo's Nest, like very much, uh, having plain long black hair is my costume because I, I try to play somewhat of an every woman in that show. <laughs> I know. Well, we'll get to, uh, we'll get to Wong Fu, Wong Flu over, over the, the cuckoo's <laughs> nest in just a second. Uh, I want to talk to you more about, um, your new show coming up called the Wong Street Journal. Yeah. I'm going to actually do this horizontally so that, um, I'm flip oh, this everyone's horizontal. going, ah, in Periscope lenses, everyone sees the kitchen. <laughs> and uh, it will reveal more amazing backdrop as I... Oh, wow, there. you got, you got the, Wong, <laughs> the Wong t-shirt. With my messy laundry room back there. Yes, it's my yeah. beautiful loft in K-Town. So, uh, so yeah, um, let's, let's talk like this. You know, we would get more hits if I was just like, oh, you're so hot, Amy. Yes. Yeah, like that, <laughs> right, right like, here, like all, just, like, all the creeps are like, oh my God, that's right. If you like, stay tuned in, we're going to have hot girl on girl action, but first we're going to talk about my show. Yeah, we're just, <laughs> <laughs> if you stay tuned, we're going to make out. We're going to go, oh yes. Uh, see right there. We just got more, we got more followers. I bet you. Like three people right now are waiting yeah, for us to make yeah, out. Exactly. There's three people following just, uh, you. Oh, Heart, hearts yes. if you want us to make out later. Yes. Okay, yes. no hearts, so that means they don't want it. <laughs> yeah, well, I don't want too much lipstick. <laughs> I don't so, like kissing girls with lipstick. <laughs> That's my job to make the mess. So, so, so yeah, let's, let's talk about, let, let's get to um, Wong Fu. Uh, Which Wong, one? Wong Street Journal. There's two of them. There's that's three. Really, there's three of them. The first one that's coming up is Wong Street Journal. Right? Yeah, the two old shows, which are not happening soon is this which is a film you can buy that that's Wong flew over the cuckoo's nest and then my other show is going green the Wong way so I have to actually start start phasing out the last name and stuff because people are getting confused they're just like what show what show I don't know what show you're doing anymore so um so, so yeah, the Wong tell, us journal, about, tell us about the Wong Street Journal the Wong Street Journal that was uh okay so this is my fifth solo show and I, uh, after touring this big monster, I, I think people who know me are like, oh, it's Christina Sob story about uh, touring the show. So I've toured Cuckoo's Nest uh, since 2006. That's a long time to tour a show about depression and suicide among Asian American women. And you've, done, uh, you've done 40 venues, right? Over. Yeah, over easily venues. over. I mean, and this is everything from excerpts to full shows. I mean, it's a, it's a long time and I think what's interesting about theater is your body is so alive in the story and so this story is a story or I, I wrote or you know this narrative I made how many years ago and to like bring my body through that again it's like you imagine anything that you made eight years ago and having to recreate that as you're growing older like my body has changed my relationships have changed like my history has changed 
and then like have to enter this space as funny as the show is it's just really hard mm -hmm. so um i made two subsequent shows uh one was going green the long way and the other was cat lady and uh both of those just sort of mind things in my history one going green was about not owning a car in la so i had a car that ran on vegetable oil uh pink mercedes it was in the la times it caught on fire almost died and uh, that became the seed for this show about all my failures in sustainable living. Um, everything from using a diva cup. I don't know if anyone else uses diva cups, but they're these menstrual cups. I should, if I knew I was going to talk about it, I would have brought it and shown you all. It's like this little cup, and then you, <laughs> you stick it inside. And I'm and actually going to flip. I'm actually going to flip the camera okay. to. to visual of how a diva. And so you stick it inside, but like, <laughs> but a diva cup. Um, I've only tried it once. Uh, my friends swear by it. it. Got stuck in me. It totally got stuck in me. And, uh, and so there's other stories. I, I was a. Uh, I grew up in San Francisco. I was a door to door canvasser for the Sierra Club, and I was really good at it. This is like a shitty job nobody wants, right? Like you see people with clipboards and the at the you know the promenade or whatever, and you avoid them because you know they're going to eventually ask you for money. I was actually really good at it because I didn't look like. I didn't look like a threat. So most people would open their door for me and I knew how to wedge myself in the doorway. And, uh, but eventually as the summer wore on, I got less and less good at it. So th that, that's going green the long way. And now, uh, and I, I just sort of found, I was very blessed that I was able to work as an artist, but it, it wasn't easy. It's like so much hustling to get work and to get remunerated for your work. And uh, I just was like looking towards the future and I was like, I don't know what to do anymore. And I was having an existential crisis. I was totally having my uh, my privileged eat, pray, love moment where I was like, I just got to get out of here and just do something I just don't understand at all. Because if I have to live with a new show for the next four or five years or more, I, I want it to be, I look at shows as sort of like, I describe it as like a dog puzzle or dog toy. And like, I get tired of, um, of a, uh, a project after a while and I want to just try something new. So I, uh, anyway, so I was just like, I'm going to Africa. I've never been to China before. This is where my grandparents immigrated from. You've never been to China? No. <laughs> I've been to Taiwan. I did Love Boat, which is the program for over, but I've never been to China. I might go next year for the first time. But are you Chinese? I am. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> I'm part Chinese, part crazy. Uh, yeah, I'm very, I'm so I'm really Chinese. I'm super Chinese. Uh, uh, anyway, so I set out to like do that thing that people that I never got to do post college, which was go somewhere and, and live abroad. And, and I could only afford to do it for a month, uh, mostly cause I, it's mostly the, the time I couldn't afford, but, um, to be away from all my responsibilities. And I didn't know what I was getting myself into because it was so unlike any show I'd ever done before, but I really just needed to, uh, just try something and 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 I knew it was going to be confusing I knew that the privilege that I would bring with me would be really confusing um I knew that I uh uh it would be really uncomfortable I knew I'd have to confront a lot of my own stereotypes about that continent I mean I think the only images that most of us get from that continent are like images of like save the children commercials or like uh, another warlord kidnapped a bunch of people, you know, uh, or AIDS, you know, just like, it's very, it's very, uh, this brush of trauma has, has painted this entire continent. And yet it's obviously more diverse than that. So, so a lot of you, that. you started to get into rap. Right? So, okay. So basically fast forward, I get there, I go to Northern Uganda where there was a civil war that, uh, ended in 2006. And so this area of Northern Uganda has not developed as quickly as the southern part of that country, which is, is uh, this, the, the capital at least is super urban. Um, and, uh, and so this place- Oh, we're getting hearts. <laughs> My friend because, Henry just uh, because joined. Because think Thanks, that Henry. we're going to make out soon. <laughs> um, anyway. Uh, hearts if you like the interview. Okay, so we'll get into the making out. Let's talk about the Ugandan civil war yes, first. Yes, yes, let's do that. Uh, so, so if you remember Joseph, Kony, there was a video called Kony 2012. He's the warlord that uh, just basically terrorized that area and, and he recruited children as soldiers and it was really awful, right? And so this, this, so he is, him and his men have since fled towards Central Africa and now this area where the war really 
had affected where all these people were put in camps is now in recovery mode. So that's where I was. Um, and, uh, and so not everybody I met was someone who had escaped Coney or survived that. Uh, there's a, because what, what happens in developing areas is once an area is safer and the economy is building again, people move there to take advantage of a growing economy. It's like a boom town. Uh -huh. And so, uh, my third day there, I was in a hotel that was really just set up for Western people. And I was like, I can't just be cooped up in this hotel all day. Ah, and there was no Wi-Fi, And I'm like, ah, you know, like, you don't, like, I don't think Americans get like how addicted we are to our devices. And I was just like, ah, ah, ah. <clears throat> like, I need, you know, just like, I need to, what am I going to do? And I, you know, I was like, you know, gonna... yeah, I was I, just off, um, off mm -hmm. story. Um, I was at a journalism conference, right? Uh -huh. And then, uh, they ask you to take your device and then give it to the person next to you. And it's I was scary. so enthralled into my apps that I didn't. And then the, the person next to me looked at me uh -huh. like, oh, hey, are you going to give it to me? And I was like, oh, crap. Oh, here. <laughs> it's a scary thing. <laughs> uh, it's a scary thing to let go of your device and, and just to be present. Um, and it's not, to say there, it's not to say there's no Wi-Fi or... Yeah. Or internet there, and people, my friends there are on Facebook and stuff. But to the extent to which we are on it, that's no. pretty crazy, right? <laughs> and yeah. there are many moments I'd have. Hey guys, our... you're watching Christina Wong. If you're just joining, it's Christina Wong for Amy Liu presents. Hashtag Amy Liu presents. And we are going to have hot girl on girl action very soon. But first, we're going to talk about Uganda and their civil war, <laughs> and the Wong Street <laughs> Journal, which is at the Red Cat. Too. Yes, yes, we'll we'll, we'll talk to you in just a minute. <laughs> Uh, I'm going to flip the camera over again I, to I go back to like Christina. I feel like save this, it's going to save That's... I don't know. Well, it's, we'll find out. We'll, we'll find out how everyone it complains about your crappy video. <laughs> I'm not saying it's crappy, but if it was crappy, they would complain. But um, I, I think that's why, you know, it's just that this is uh, organic, you know. This is, like, natural, and this is just kind of on this, the fly. This is the digital... This is, you know, why hang out when you can record it, make it ephemeral, and let people hang out with you? Yeah, it's, exactly. it's like a hangout, you know? Do, do hangouts have to be perfect? No. Yeah. <laughs> no. There's this thing called human interaction, which we used to do. <laughs> anyway, okay, um, yeah. okay. Yeah, go on. so Uganda. I'm in northern Uganda. I, I decide to go look for some street food, and it's pitch black out there. Like, I didn't even know nighttime could look like this like it is like we have so much light pollution it was it's it's and there, there are things called stars in the sky and so i'm walking i'm trying to memorize everywhere i'm walking because there's no way for me to get back if i forget where i walk and i see these guys cooking food and uh, they try to charge me too much and i see two of the men holding hands and uh and as i'm like like bickering with them about like don't charge me the mzungu price mzungu is the word for a white person or foreigner swahili uh, uh, I see these men holding hands and I'm like, is this the underground gay community in Gulu? And I was like, oh my God, this is, I, and I read about this. I read how people have to organize in secret. And I was like, oh my God, they're, they're organizing in secret. I have to help them. So they go come into this room with us. This sounds like an awful idea, right? Going, oh my God, eight people. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> well, welcome, there, there were eight men. I know there are people following, but there were like eight guys. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I followed in northern Uganda, site of this civil war, into a dark room, and it turns out there's a music studio back there, and so we recorded, we started to record a music album that night, uh -huh. and that album still plays on the uh, radio there. Did you rap? Mm -hmm. Of course, of course. Can so, you yeah. rap your favorite verse? Uh, see the world through her eyes, like Dustin Hoffman and Tootsie, you gotta earn her consent if you wanna go near her pussy. So, wow, you know, it just comes out, just flows. Who knew? Who knew I had this talent? Who knew you were a like, rapper? No one, it took me being in my 30s wandering around northern Uganda to get discovered. Like, that never happens out here. I don't know. Yeah, now you can add rapper to your title. Oh, I do. Oh, and believe me, I do. Believe <laughs> me. So, yeah, so that's so, so, I mean, that sounds like this fun kind of romantic, like, oh, yay, Westerners in Africa. It's actually, it, that's, that's the fun part. Like, it was so complicated and it was so difficult to figure out how to be and like, what was I even doing there? And, um, you know, I think in America, people of color 
talk about people of color solidarity, right? And that's not necessarily true across the board, that, that obviously African Americans and Asian Americans have completely different experiences, but there are shared experiences around marginalization, right? And, um, but none of that translates for sure over in Africa where I am just a Mzungu. Um, it's very clear that if you're not a Ugandan over there, you have resources that you've come for or you have resources to bring to people. So, um, so it became very tricky and it became tricky about how to document what was happening because there is a history of people from the West showing up to poor countries and like displaying the natives or displaying pictures and and I really had to be airplane I had to really be cognizant of how to best do that so so how does how did that translate into the Wong Street Journal? so the Wong Street Journal uh, is uh, it's sort of a, a drama dramatized is that the word dramatized yeah dramatized I like that word dramatized uh, of version of what happened to me. Uh, I described myself as a jaded social media person who was like getting on fights with people on the internet about conversations around race and calling people out all day from behind my iPad. And um, I think that, I feel like this is a new archetype of Asian Americans that has uh, come up in the last few years is like the angry Asian American on uh, writing angry blogs and stuff like that. And, and that's who I was. And um, and then I was just having this moment, like I get this thrill when I would get uh, retweeted or this thrill when I would get favorite, just like you right now going, oh my God, we have eight people watching. Oh, my life is changing. Like, yeah, <laughs> it's, it's, it's really life changing. I know it's eight, right. Eight is my favorite number. So I was really That's happy. A good, uh, hello, all eight of you are important. But, <laughs> um, but it's also like, so to, uh, and we will make out soon. So stay tuned. Me and Amy are going to make out soon. But anyway, uh, but like there's this thrill, right? Of being, <laughs> Uh, of, of, of sort of validation. Like I am not a big uh, corporation like Google or Apple, right? So so my stock price, but my personal stock price in the forms of likes and retweets and comments, I can feel go up every day when it's like, attention, attention. And, and that's who I was. And that's the character I'm playing at the top of the show. And then I have this moment where like, is this, this is my legacy? Like YouTube followers and, and, and likes? Like that, this is not... It's not okay, right? I, I have to have something more. More meaningful, I, huh? You know, and I think it's sort of this American dilemma. Like, we we, we are told that we are great and that we can change the world and, and all this kind of stuff. And then it becomes very unclear how to do it. There, there, there are sort of those formulaic things like, go to Africa and fix it. or uh, And that always seems to be, like, the, the, the thing that this narrative that has been presented, at least through, throughout my life in popular culture, it's like, whenever... People feel bad about themselves. They go to a poor place and fix it. And I think that that is a lot more complicated. Uh, that, that, that it's not quite clear what it is you have to offer once you show up. Um, I, I think one thing that we're told in charity is uh, bring your, give your old clothes. Give your old food to the starving. But then what? Like it, 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 it could pot potentially put people out of business who are... Um, fixing shoes or making clothing for other people if, if free stuff keeps showing up. You're yawning, so uh, this is obviously captivating. <laughs> no, no, I, I slept at five. You, you yawned in I, Africa. How dare you, no. Amy? How I, dare you? I slept at five. So I slept at five, so, so you know, because I was, you know, so excited I couldn't sleep for this mm. interview. So I was so excited that I totally just... Uh, I totally mm -hmm. slept at five and, mm -hmm. and uh, had three hours of sleep. <laughs> You're like, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> okay, I'm, my friend Tractivist just joined. Oh, let okay. me, oh, oh, let me. Oh, I want to say hi to everybody. Hi, hi, everybody. Hi, everyone. Welcome to Late Night with Amy Lou. And I'm showing my bra strap right yeah. now. Yeah. Chris. And we are, it's Friday We're going to make some we're love gonna, later. We're going <laughs> to, we're going to have hot love. We also already lost two people. They're like, they're not making out. This is a hoax. <laughs> This is not social justice. This is a total hoax. This one looks so old. This one has a nice ombre, but this one looks like a pre ten cowboy. She looks too old. You look I don't like want a raver, to... actually. A raver. Oh like, god. Ravers oh, do this. Oh, take it know? out. Take it. No, you I, look I, like I a raver. I sort of like I the have desert. the same thing. I did the same thing. I only wore it on my head. Oh. <laughs> okay. For those of you guys watching, it's hashtag Amy Liu presents, and we're with Christina Wong, performance artist, comedian. 
She has a couple of shows coming out. Oh yeah, she's a one rap- show. I have one she's, show coming. Yeah, out. you have you you have you have you're also a rapper now. I'm I've been a rapper. Yeah. For oh yeah. Shout out to Tractivist. Hi Tractivist. I saw you just joined. Uh-huh. Um. Okay. So, uh, um, let's get back to Christina. I'm gonna flip the camera. Wow. We are gonna put Channel Four out of business. <laughs> Good morning, America is like shit. Amy okay. was on Periscope. It's over. <laughs> wow. Like, it's so um, good. Yeah. Uh, hearts, hearts. If you like the interview. Oh, stop! Stop kissing their asses. We need to make them heart without us telling them to do it. Yeah, yeah. Because I, I just, I'm new to this, you know. Mm-hmm. Like, because then I'm wondering if, if you should ask for hearts or if you should just wait for hearts, you know. Or just, or just, yeah. Or just let it just flow organically. Okay. Well, yeah, yeah. yeah so okay, back that. to the so, walk so the street show. Demo. Yes, the show. So the show features a hand sewn set. If you you can go look over there. The, my my whole set is in these two containers, which are behind you right now. So that duffel bag by the fireplace and this <laughs> and the suitcase. I have the entire felt replica of the New York Stock Exchange in those two bags. And uh, I'm very proud. I sewed it myself. I had some help from my friend Monica and a couple of um, assistant friends. Who uh, those two friends had never sewn before, but like we basically over hundreds of hours, mostly me and my director Emily did a lot of cutting, created uh, the New York Stock Exchange and felt. So um, you know how they're like tickers that show stocks going up and down. So instead of corporate symbols, it is uh, the last names of social justice people or civil rights leaders. Uh, hidden in the stock uh, ticker numbers that go by. And there's a moving ticker that weighs like the amounts of likes and retweets I'm getting. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's a larger conversation, I think. What? what Just the emphasis that we have as a society now that social media is growing and and it's the future now Mm -hmm. and just the emphasis of how many followers and subscribers and likes and favorites and retweets yeah. and stuff Yeah, I mean, that's have. our it's capital like... as individuals, as artists. It's, it's not, it's not, it's weird because I uh, came, uh, I was on the heels of solo performance in the 90s. I was still in school at that time. But out of the 90s was a whole era of solo performers like the, the NEA4, like John Fleck, Holly Hughes, Karen Finley. Oh my God, who's the fourth one? <laughs> John Flack, Tim, Tim, Tim Miller, and and uh, and they all um, uh, were doing like incredible work addressing uh, the lack of Republican response to the AIDS crisis and all this kind of stuff. And live performance was like this critical meeting point to talk about that kind of stuff. And now there's almost no sense of history around anything that happened before YouTube, around almost any like if it didn't go viral, like we. We barely remember it. And a sense of memory is so short. And uh, I don't know. I think about this a lot as someone who still works in the live medium. And I often get, uh, not a lot, I get trolly emails from people who are like, why don't you address this, that, or this? And it's like, I do in my shows. Like, and I'm not going to, like, address the complexities of black and Asian relations. I do in Wall Street Journal, but, like, I can't do it in a tweet, you know, I, I and I, I, I yeah, you're gonna have to go watch. Yeah, the I show. feel like that's the beauty of the live medium is is like all these things that you're demanding and accusing me of not doing. It's like no, I'm doing it. It's just you're not coming to the shows, so suck it. You know, and it's not that I need to change my medium. <laughs> yeah, because that's a you know maybe I do, but it's that's another undertaking. This is just how I know to work, and and there's something kind of great about being live with the audience and be very vulnerable with them especially this show is very difficult because i have to confront uh i confront issues around white privilege and also how i benefit from white privilege in africa you know and as i'm read as like I, so it's basically if you're not black then you're white even though you're asian that's sort of broad yeah even but, though you're but, asian. I, but I, it was it'd be more referred to uh as like when they see your white skin you know, oh, so it was more okay. like a, a your, the tone it was of more your, whiteness your skin. or light skin privilege, but I think whiteness encompasses a lot. And now we can say hi to famous actor Edward Hong is here. We're doing a Periscope interview. We're doing a Periscope interview. Oh, it's Edward Hong. Can you come say hi? This Edward. Can I? Can I? Can I yeah, move the camera this, over? Yeah. With, um, hi. What's up? Hi, Edward Hong. What's What's happening? This is that uh, Amy Lou presents. Uh, America out of business. 
<laughs> putting America out of business. Good morning, America out of business. Putting good, putting Good Morning America out of business. And are you going to replace them as the hosts or? Yes, with Periscope. Periscope. Okay, I, I fully support this. Yeah. I'll, I'll be one of your yeah. daily reporters and we're on the field of what's My happening. My glamorous life, everybody. Yes, and then we'll go to K Town and then we'll interact with the locals and then eat a lot of tacos. I don't know. Thanks, Edward. Great. Good to see you. Yeah. Okay, my, back gla to my glamorous life is a landlady. It's my tenant. Oh, that's your tenant. He lives with me. Oh. He lives with me. He's not your Airbnb. No. Okay. No, I. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You're say. He's here forever. <laughs> <laughs> you know. Um, okay. Yeah. Let's 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 keep going with the, the. Okay. Keep going. Keep talking. The Wong Street Journal. So how can people watch? When is it? And how it can they buy tickets? So and all that great. Stuff. Yes, it's November 12th through 15th. That's a Thursday through Sunday at the Red Cat. Um, that is under the Walt Disney Concert Hall. It's there. It's like 270 seats. So I got to get around 1,000 butts in the seat this one weekend. Only one weekend. Not coming back to L.A. as far as I know. Uh, and you can go to redcat.org for tickets. Okay, and there, there's their discount code. There's no discount code. Well, they're selling really fast right now, so they don't, they, they're not going to offer a discount. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, but people can go if they want to volunteer. Is that right? Yeah, you, they can volunteer and usher. And I can't remember what the. You have to write the house manager there. The website is just on the red cat, right? Red, I don't know what the uh, email is, but um, yeah, you can ask to volunteer. Yeah. And well, usher. And, well, and you, yeah, you still get to see the full show. Yeah, I'm really excited because I actually, uh, you know, I registered like this. Yay! I got good. you. I made a new rule that if anybody wants to ask me for favors or information or anything, they can't. Uh, I won't give it to them unless they come to the show. So you don't <laughs> get my time for free. I'm sorry. I'm working really hard. It's called reciprocation, baby. <laughs> Let's do it. I'm ex I'm really excited for your show. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I I'm excited too. to see it. Yeah. Um, so, so, uh, you also have something coming up too next Tuesday, uh, called yeah, the, Tuesday the Tuesday night, night, night cafe. cafe. I'm, yeah. I'm just hosting it. And, uh, one of my personas, I guess, or may, many, whatever. I'm just basically trying to, I, I, I feel that Asian Americans don't come in enough theater and I get it because we have not seen ourselves a lot in theater. And, uh, and this generation is real cheap. No offense. Y'all real cheap. You'll pay like, you'll throw it on $50 <laughs> at the bar but if it's like a $20 ticket to see this hand sewn set and this funny lady, you're just like, what? Can, can I get a cup? What? And you can like come out with it. So that's where I'm calling you out, young people. And then we're going to do a girl and girl scene. But like, we're, I'm calling you out. You need it. <laughs> so I'm going, I'm hosting. I'm going to hustle, my, hustle like the children in to the show. But yeah, it should be fun. It's my second time. Have I hosted before? I guess it's my, it's definitely my second time hosting. I've performed at it before. I did the, a piece a few years ago where I gained five pounds in 10 minutes. It was mostly through drinking a lot of water and it was all about what's weighing on you. And I actually gained six pounds over 10 minutes. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. Don't do that. <laughs> Don't do what I did. It was, it was, it was scary because I was reading about, hmm, this could be dangerous, but it was, it was actually more the anxiety. Um, I did another piece that was in this temporary rock garden in front of the JACCC that uh, where the where that Tuesday night at the cafe thing was held, uh, and I put rocks in my pants and I like they were sealed off at the ankles and I walked the rocks over and it was about how no how no no one's illegal like they, we keep using this phrase illegal alien when it it just <laughs> it just sort of distances the humanness of people no no one's uh, like we're all like if you want to look at some pilgrims and stuff like pretty much everybody is here illegally except for native people. Um, so it was sort of like about migrating rocks through my pants from one side of the space to another. Uh, what else? What else can I say? Like, no, um, what's the line? Do you know the lineup this coming Tuesday? No, I can look it up, but I don't. <laughs> I don't. So, uh, <laughs> it'll just come for me. It'll be great. It's free. Are you going to be doing uh, any uh, performance or comedy do, related things yeah i'll do stuff it's hard to do Wong street journal because it's so involved and it's an outdoor space and um yeah i'll, I'll be doing performancey stuff but i don't know if i can excerpt anything I, I keep asking him for a lineup so i can see if i can slide in a few minutes of the show but i might rap maybe i'll do a rap song oh my gosh you know 
throw them out. I think everybody would love to see that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, they keep requesting my songs in Northern Uganda. So uh, I want to know. I, as I advertise Ciclavia as my fan. <laughs> <laughs> I want to know. Um, oh, yeah. So uh, for Tuesday Night Cafe, right? Mm-hmm. Tell us the details where, who, when. Uh, it's in front of so there's East West Players, which is a theater in Little Tokyo in Los Angeles. And that courtyard out in front, it's a gorgeous courtyard. They, they Every other Tuesday they do, in the summers and through the falls before it gets too cold, they do a uh, free outdoor. It's the longest running um, semi-curated and open mic uh, performance. You're picking your nose and it's sort of distracting. Amy no, I'm good. picking my um, <laughs> acne scarab, okay. actually, because it's I really love, bothering me. I love... Uh, it's bothering me a lot. <laughs> I feel like that makes me cut her light, is, like, I love picking scabs. I used to yeah, it's like, <sighs> it's, like, addicting. <sighs> so, <laughs> <laughs> um, what else? What else? Who, who's, yeah, yeah, so... still hanging on for dear life over there? Yeah, five. Wow. Others are just, like, they're not. Um... So yeah, the it's at Tuesday. Uh, it's an outdoor seven, performance. I think? I think it's at seven, right? I believe it so. Seven. You should come. It's nice, and then you can pack a picnic if you want, and and eat, and um, say hi as long as you're not scary. And uh, it's like it's a really good vibe, very supportive atmosphere, and there are open mic slots um, you can sign up for. It's a Say, long running. Thanks. For the five viewers that are watching, we really appreciate it. And shout out to Tuesday Night Cafe. Yeah, I think out. you guys are doing great things. Uh, you guys are, they're, they're, uh, they're a space, right, for artists, minority artists, right? I say marginalized. Marginalized artists. Because we are not minorities. Minorities, I feel like, is a really dehumanizing word. It's like... Well, is it, it, it marginalized? It, or is it, it, it marginalized? Marginalized or refers marginalized? to the act of, of being oppressed or or, mar- or literally marginalized. We're just like, if, if we Isn't that oppressive too? No, I don't think so. I think it refers to the action of it happening versus minority, which just sort of embeds that basically white people have are not min- are not minor or, or major and uh, oh i see it makes sense like yeah, it, it's like sense. it's it's sort of like why people have started saying cisgender versus like oh well, i'm a female and that's a tranny like it, it's saying like like i'm a cisgender woman which means i i live the gender that i was born into and that's a transgender woman you know and so it's just like basically it doesn't create a sense that this is normal and that's not. It's just, we're just all expressing gender differently. Yeah. Okay. So how about of, diverse? Check, how about, check this. Check your teeth. Check your teeth. Oh, thank you. Yeah, Speaking this always expressing happens. gender. Because uh, <laughs> uh, I put chapstick before that and it always yeah. smears on my teeth. Yeah. So thanks for telling me that. Okay. While I correct it on the camera. Um, <laughs> yeah. So uh, it's it's a space for diverse voices, right? Mm-hmm. As yeah. Well. And, and, uh, is, has historically been um, curated and produced by Asian Americans interested in social justice. So you definitely see that uh, energy coming through the work and the vibe, and and in terms of it being very supportive and and very inclusive of like other um, like nonprofits who are working on campaigns or things like that. Like I feel like that's. Mm-hmm. Okay, I'm going to flip the camera back to you, um, but I do want to ask you, uh, let's talk a little bit about Wong flew over the cuckoo's nest. Mm-hmm. Again, you're watching Hashtag Amy Lee Presents. Thanks so much for watching. I'm going to flip the camera over to Christina. So, uh, Wong flew over the cuckoo's nest. and it, it This it's, old it's, beast, it's, okay. Yeah, this, <laughs> okay, yeah. we're going to lose all Sorry. five followers right now. <laughs> no, we got one more. Okay. <laughs> Six followers. You know, the reason why I ask for hearts is because it's so cool because it floats up. Yeah. And it disappears. Mm. And it's different colors. Like love. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, uh, Wong Fu over the cuckoo's nest. Are you still doing any more shows or like, are you I, done my me last, uh, I did some shows right before the end of the school year this year, but I, my green sweater, my, signature green sweater which was uh sewn it was it's caught it's this very specific costume piece which was sewn by my my seamstress and monica to fall apart and unravel so what happens during the course of the show is the character christina wong is like hey everyone i'm gonna 
I'm going to find out why Asian American women are, this is a paraphrase what I'm doing right now, are, are killing themselves and, uh, and I'm going to stop it. I'm going to stop it. Me by myself. And like, that's a crazy promise. You're for, playing Christina Wong. I'm playing a character named Christina Wong. And so this, so this character of Christina Wong has sort of set out this agenda that she's going to fix this problem, which is an impossible thing right to fix especially inside a theater show and and what is happening during the show is the sweater that i'm wearing is falling apart like so threads are coming out and and it's because i can't destroy a sweater every show and then remake a sweater monica made me the sweater that falls apart so i lost that sweater in sacramento and uh, i thought i felt like that was a sign that i can't tour it anymore she said she'll make me a new one and it'll take some time and, and i'm happy to have one that's like it was so matronly the sweater that I had for the show and I could stand to sex it up a little on stage. So, uh, so yeah, I, I, uh, I, I'm not, I would much rather tour this new show is how I feel. I'm happy to like look at different requests I get. And if I feel strongly about, um, the entity that's asking me to come, then I, then I'd like to come, then I, I'll, I'll come. But, um, I feel that this new show is actually more current and just, more sort of relevant. Speak. Yeah, more relevant. It's not that depression and that is not relevant, but I, I think this is the time to begin to think uh, about intersectionality and to think about uh, not just like these are Asian problems, but how do the issues that affect us also affect other communities and what is the framework that's making that happen? Right. Now we're losing everybody. I just said the word framework. Usually framework is a... Oh, no. There's still no? six people. <laughs> So I, I want to ask you about uh, the the stigma of mental illness mm -hmm. um, in the Asian American community, mm -hmm. or even in general, in the mm -hmm. society in general. Okay. And what are your thoughts on that? Well, I think culturally, there's a couple things. One is this model minority myth, right? And so when I first started touring the show in 2006, and even when I was creating it in 2005, I would tell people I was working on the show and they would meet like people who are not Asian would say, really? Asian women have really high rates of depression and suicide. They seem fine to me, right? Like this is the diagnosis because it's like, I very much feel like because we're not like <clears throat> shooting up schools or like, like we're just sort of silently suffering. Like there aren't, uh, we're not notorious for like, hey, like raising our hands going, I'm not feeling well. Um, the stereotype is more like, look at all our good grades and look at the, the good office jobs that we're holding down. And for this reason, because of that, it's very hard for people to believe that anything could possibly be wrong. That's one dynamic, this model minority myth. The second dynamic is that, uh, is that culturally, I don't feel that it is, th there aren't a lot of words to even describe mental health and, and to describe that anything might be going wrong is very shameful. So I'm third generation Chinese American. And for me to ex even when I was young to express that I was not feeling well was like super embarrassing for my family. Like they did not want to know they did like, my mom was like, no, you're fine. Like, it was just like, I remember asking like, could I see a therapist? Not even knowing what a therapist was, just seeing them on TV and a show called growing pains. And the father was a therapist. And I was like, that seems great. Like I would love to have someone to talk to. And, and uh, my mom's reaction was like cost too much. And, and if someone finds out you won't get a job. So, uh, mm. so to me like that, the, the, that is where the, the issue is. It, 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 and I also think that therapy for, for many years has very much been, um, something that has been like associated as a very white thing that this is not something that Asians do. And a lot of therapists have not had cultural competency. So it can feel that much more scarier for someone who in their family, they are the first person to go see a therapist to go pay somebody to listen to their issues. And then um, it might be trickier for a therapist to pick up what's wrong exactly, uh, maybe because it's expressed differently. And there are statistics that people of color express their symptoms around mental illness somatically. So rather than say, I'm depressed, yesterday I was feeling low, today I feel better. Instead, and I feel like I see this with older people in my family, they'll be like, I have a stomach ache today. You know, so, they'll, so, so it's more hinted towards like a physical health thing. And, you know, there are, of course, exceptions to the rule. People will say, well, there's, I have a friend who's always very, like, upfront about their emotions. But, but I would say, from what I've observed and touring the show and doing my research, is that uh, there's not a, the, the, uh, the, the need to save face is, is so great that it has now tricked the whole country into thinking that Asians have no problems. 
Um, so that's that's a lot of what I'm confronting. So in this idea of the show, I keep playing with this idea of fiction, uh, and um, uh, and that and that the this need to maintain this idea of fiction or this fictitious picture, and and how difficult it is to hold that up is actually what is tearing this character apart. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So mm -hmm. so the 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 show addresses all of these issues: saving face, stigma, and like, taking on too much taking... impossible tasks. I could I sort of compare... I could definitely relate to all that. Yeah. You know, oh yeah. I, and I, I I mean I feel like that is why the show was also very successful. Was pe people were like. I can I identify with it. And what was hard is I feel like in touring this show so long, I became sort of, I became the problem that I was trying to address because I, it's a, it's a big undertaking to decide to take a, to, to create a show. And for me, I, I didn't go at this like a hobby. I was like, no, I, I, I want to tour this so much. I want this to be my livelihood. That's real. That was a, that's kind of a crazy decision to make, and I would have rethought it if I could have gone back to it because it's hard to on command like bring up the stories when I feel like okay, I'm over this now. <laughs> I'm over the show, but I like kept doing it again and again, and it, it was really hard. It really kind of messed with a lot of how people read me. I think um, I I think in my writings and in my shows, I play a persona named Christina Wong, and here in life like right now I think I'm a more honest version of myself with you as I talk about this but I, I've also said what I'm saying before to other interviewers so so you know am I is this real is this not I don't know um but I uh yeah so I I, I think it, if I did it again I would have d taken a lot better care of myself I would have uh I probably um, would have checked in with more people and said hey I'm about to go down the well with no rope around my waist you want to just like, can you just do check-in calls with me? Because this is going to be really... I didn't realize how emotionally difficult it would be and that it didn't have to be so painful. And I and I also like felt like I had to save everybody and fix everybody with the show, even though the show itself, I make fun of this idea of me as somebody who's trying to do this impossible task of fixing everything. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I, I kind of compare it. Have you ever gone to a house party where the ho you're, you know, you see the hostess and the hostess is really frazzled and the hostess is trying to, like, make everyone feel good. You're, you're having fun, you're having fun. And they're not having fun at their own party. And then you go to the kitchen and they're, like, crying because they're falling apart. Like, that's sometimes... That's like <laughs> I, I can definitely relate to that, that too. Does that make sense? Like, like you're it's trying like, to make everybody happy yeah. to the point that you're not happy and that... That's a little bit like this character exhausting. in the show, but that was also me in touring the show. Like I was trying to make every client happy, every theater I was going to happy. I was trying to make sure the audience, because not everyone totally understood what I was doing. Like I would still get the strangest Q and A questions that were just like, "So why is it happening? So that really happened to you?" Like it was just like these, like very, like I'm like hoping that like people would tune into the conceptual things I was doing, and and uh, and that wasn't always happening. Mm -hmm. So, uh, uh, the Koreatown festival starts so we can hear that in the background. <laughs> yeah. Um, um, wow. That's, you know, really eye opening. you know, just talking to you about all these issues. Yeah. You know, uh, what, what do you think, what do you think, uh, you know, a little bit back to the Wong street journal and the whole social media and the followings and the likes, favorites, retweets and hard. subscribers uh, and stuff. Well, how do you think that? you know, you people, you know, young people coming up, up and coming can deal with the pressure of trying to get as many likes and followers and subscribers and I, stuff. I mean, I have a few thoughts. One is when I see the YouTube stars who are doing, the Asian YouTube stars are doing really well. I'm like, really? Like this is stuff. These are skits we used to perform in college. So it's not that the, it's not, I, I but everyone's like, oh my God, like that kind of scares me that like, for me, this specific like Asian American studies 101 and it's it's even more reductive than that so in some of these situations like some of these videos that are like 10 things asian moms say and i'm like really we're gonna like just fall back on you know accent jokes and stuff like that uh so I stereotypes at, right yeah so stereotypes that don't that don't get full stuff that is like a borderline anti-feminist in the sense that it's just like assumes a certain heteroness of people and an audience and I don't know. I just like to think a little bit more critically. And I look at I look at some of that and I'm like, oh man, it's like we're just constantly reinventing the wheel. But I I look at something like fresh off the boat and I'm like, we 
20 years since the last Asian American family had a primetime show and we're still like introducing ourselves to the world. Hey, we just got here. And, and you know, I maybe this is me also as a third generation person that I feel like there's so many more stories and we're just getting, we're just like chipping the corner of it. And it's frustrating for me as a solo performer because I would like to move on to other topics because I feel like I've done that. And then um, like me going to Africa is kind of, <laughs> you know, for me it was moving on, but I, the first 20 minutes of the show is basically me like trying to teach the audience how to watch the show because in earlier drafts of this show, I realized I couldn't just like, hey, this is what happened to me in Africa because not everyone understood that I had a basic knowledge around, like I understand how wrong it is to just show images of people at, or just like just crack jokes about Africa without any d deeper uh, like critical lens around it. And so, um, so th this is happening in a lot of shows. I feel like it's something I see in at least theater shows around people of color, like effective ones is they have to very much create a rubric with their audience. So like, this is the page we're on. Okay, now let's tell the story, you know? And um, it's something that dominant culture, people from dominant culture don't, do not have to explain as much because that rubric already exists it's set. every day. You know? How do you think you mentioned about reinventing the wheel how do you think um how do you think I, they're re reinventing the wheel how uh uh well i i feel like um one well i'll, I'll name some stuff uh my career like took off <laughs> two years ago now i've been touring this show since 2006 and i had two shows before that right like i was touring as an artist and i just went like super viral when i wrote this blog about white guys with yellow fever and this to me was a topic I'd covered 15 years ago when I had a fake mail and a ride website called bigbadchinesemama.com. And I thought, okay, I'm done. I've covered it. And other editors had approached me and they were like, will you write for us and write about this topic? And I was like, really? It's so old hat. And so I wrote this thing about like sort of what Asian fetishes 2.0 look like, right? Because it used to be these guys who would wear ninja costumes and like, just like greet me in really bad Japanese in the grocery store and like literally like follow me and stalk me. <laughs> and and now it's like they're guys covered in tats and they play in bands and they're cool. But if you look in their history, they've only dated Asian women, you know? And um and and they're trickier, harder to find. They're much harder to find and spot. And I was writing about like just how the the sloppiness in which uh these guys talk about their dating preferences and, and the false equivalencies they use. Well, don't you have a white fetish? And it's like, but we don't share the same history of marginalization and, and the same history of oppression. And you could say that if we we're both treated the same, which we are not. And so for you to assume that I've been treated the same as you is is racist thinking, is, is, is assuming a certain privilege that I do not actually have. So, um, so anyway, that went super viral and every, uh, most people misunderstood the essay. They just read, because that's what happens on the internet. You read the headline, you make a decision, and then you start, uh, or you're dating an Asian woman, you feel really defensive, and you write Christina an angry email. And, um, but, but to me, I was like, have we not covered this topic already? Like, why is this a thing again? So that's why I feel like reinventing the wheel, like even me, it was like, I didn't know that this is what I would be writing. Like, I mean, in the last two years since that happened, I've been on, television a shitload and uh or for me it's a shitload and and all these great opportunities have come up and all stems from the stupid blog which to me i felt like wasn't i i think my shows are much more revolutionary you know and then the sad thing is most people who send me angry emails are demanding the sort of nuance that are in my shows and i feel i can only uh, be played out inside my live shows like people who want more nuanced uh, information about like, well, why do you lump all people of color in the same category? I actually do not. I feel that 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 black folks have had it super bad, and uh, and and that there are certain privileges that that uh, certain white privileges that Asian Americans get to participate and have in ways that Black Americans don't. And I feel like a lot of that is talked about in the Wall Street Journal. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. as far as. Uh young people or even up and comers um, worried about subscribers and likes and follows and retweets, how can they deal with all that pressure? <laughs> this is like, 
I used to be like, what about the pressure of just seating in school? How did like the question I usually get is how do how do kids deal with the pressure of 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 picking a major? Like this no, is that's funny, the like a, the pressure. Um, there there's, is there's, there's a pressure to be liked on social media, huh? Like I, I mean, I feel it just as someone who's trying to keep my career afloat as uh, or or you know continue it because as artists we kind of have to live our lives on social media or be grandfathered into a like be the Marina Abramovics of the world and have had like these huge legacies beforehand and can just ride on in. Um, I I mean I think it's I think I, I wish in my heart of hearts dream of dreams that that there was just more connections young people have to just making live work that's not constantly mediated like and and what would it be like to just have a human connection and i feel like i this is where i wonder if i lose track of a younger audience is because when i was younger you would call your friend and their mom would pick up and they would write down a message and that would be it and now it's like i'm texting and texting and texting with people and uh or leaving messages on their facebook page while they're asleep you know, so the sense of time and memory is completely different. And so someone who's making work using an older sense of what time and memory was, it's like, I feel like that that's a beginning of where it's not translating sometimes to younger audiences. I do feel, though, that this show, because everything is made of felt, like I have all these hashtags make, made of felt, and we do a hashtag war. Yeah, because I know that your, your um, <laughs> show deals with a lot of uh, social media and, yeah. like, issues and, like, communication and maybe even pressure. Yeah. So it's very heavily social media related. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, I am excited to see how this will go over with younger audience. So far it's done really well. In San Francisco we sold out and they went bonkers for this live hashtag war where everyone's just like flinging hashtags at each other. Because it is really so silly. Like, is this our lives now? We're just trying to make things go viral and uh, fight people. I mean, it's, there's some hashtags that are completely effective and important but um, but it also has to be combined with on the ground stuff. So like Black Lives Matter is has has shown up at the GOP debates. Like they were deba they were talking about them. that. That's an effective hashtag. But it's also coupled with like like activists who are working on the ground, who are organizing, who are having face to face meetings with people who aren't just like like let's just complain all day long about stuff. I don't see it as that. I see it as as really in, finding a way to inject themselves in. Uh, in public conversations where they did not exist before. Yeah, yeah. I agree. Yeah, you know, um, I'm going to flip again. Okay. Yeah, because, um, yeah, because I, I was, I was going to say, um, as far as that, um, I was, I've learned that your value, your self-worth mm -hmm. doesn't come from all the likes and subscribers and all that. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's great to have all that. Yeah. But then you have to also have a sense of self worth. Yeah, oh, and absolutely. Because, because if all that, if that's the, if if if, if subscribers uh -huh. and likes and followers are the only thing that validates you, then you know. I'm it, so glad there was that, no that social media. Healthy, you know, when I was a teenager, because I would, I ow, I'm just glad that I got to have my process of figuring out who I was, not in public, and I feel like now if you want to shout to the, because it used to be if you wanted to shout to the world. You would like write a letter or you'd go do a stage show and then the small audience of people could watch you. And now you can literally just like have such unhealthy interactions with people. And I'm guilty. I still do them. I still, but I'm glad I'm not a teenager <laughs> avenging people online all day long, you know? And yeah. I think, you know, something that I remind myself and keep constantly remind myself is uh -huh. just to have self-worth, you know? And it's not to have thing. external factors validate you as a person. When I turn 30, which is in the future, uh, but when I turn 30, I, uh, that's usually the age of, for a lot of women. They're like, I'm not married. I don't have babies. It's a cutoff. Now I'm way past that. But I got married when I turned 30 to myself. So I went to this Ethiopian restaurant and uh, <laughs> had vows and witnesses. And it was, it was sort of silly, but it was actually really uh, intense. And it was... I found myself crying, like looking in a mirror and going, I promise to love you forever and no matter what, I won't be mad at you. And it's like, why don't women ever say that to themselves first before they commit to doing that to another person or, or men too, you know? Um, it's like, uh, I feel like, yeah, like so much of, there's so much mythology about where joy is supposed to come from.
Oh, you have a shitload of money, you're gonna be happy. Or you have a handsome husband, you're gonna be happy. But it's like, I, I, I think that was the moment I had when I was touring. I'm like, okay, I'm traveling the world. And uh, I, I, I own a home that I, you know, I'm paying for through my art. Why am I so unhappy? And it's because I just, I was just so hard on myself, you know? Yeah. And I had to, to actually look back and go, wow, I, I pulled this off without a sugar daddy, without, you know, a trust fund and all this kind of stuff. That's something to be really proud of for me. And, 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 um, you know, I'm not saying that like, you had, have had to accomplish that and then look back and go, look what I accomplished. But, you know, I, I, I think it's made it easier for me to step into the future and not worry too much that someone is going to have to save me on the other end. Because if I keep looking at how I've gotten this far, I've had to save myself. And ultimately, you know, we have our friends and stuff who will back us up, but, but we have to, I don't know, now, now. <laughs> Oh, ultimately something or other, but, but we do have to think about how to, um, how to have our own back, which is hard. Yeah. And it's not rely on external and sometimes, factors, sometimes you need friends. Right? You do need friends, you yeah. know, but, but, uh, it's, it, it, being alive requires a lot of bravery, like doing something new and different it creates a lot of bravery, putting yourself out there, uh, in the face of like hate mail and whatever is, yeah. you know, and like, I'm going to put myself out in front of a live audience and it's hard. Like I, I, it's hard to not think about everyone who didn't show up or came, gave me a bullshit excuse for why they couldn't come, you know, because really a lot of my heart is, is in these pieces that I make. Um, but it is at the same time, it cannot be my entire life. Right. And that, that was a huge thing I had to do was say, okay, some people, some of your friends will just never come to your shows. And they'll support you. Some of your family members will just never come to your shows. And they'll never have any idea what you do. But uh, I have to be okay with it. It's that, that if it, while it's a rejection, it's not an outright rejection that I need to internalize. Mm-hmm. It's hard. Yeah. That's yeah. good advice. It's hard. It's hard advice. Well, All right. Amy, Liu, Amy Liu presents loves, <laughs> loves Christina Wong. Um, okay. Yeah, I'll, be, I'll, be, girl like, I'll be, I'll be, I'll be, I'll be going to your show. Yes. I'm really excited. You get to stay. Yeah. <laughs> you can stay. Oh, I can stay. Yeah. You can stay in my friend zone. Yeah. Oh, oh. <laughs> um, um, before we, but actually we'll save the, the, the girl on girl action until the end. But I yeah. see that you have a couple of really nice paintings. I see that you have a couple of really nice paintings oh, those are my, uh, that I wanted photos. to um, that I wanted to um, show the show yeah. you guys. So uh, I'm gonna flip the camera and okay. have Christina I'll give show. us a little tour of her paintings yeah, at her ho home. Photos. Is, oh, photos! Some actually. fans of mine actually are pretty familiar with these. This is um, these are glamour shots I took in Cambodia. So I went to Cambodia in 20. I think 2011, and I, 2010, I think it was 2010, I can't remember, I have to look it up, but it was a while ago, and I, um, I just thought it was really interesting how in parts of Southeast Asia, their, like, storekeepers have, like, really glamorous photos of themselves, and then you look down, and, like, the real version is, like, the sweaty version, <laughs> and I was just like this, I love this idea that people want to project this really gorgeous, glamorous version of themselves out on a marquee, even if, the customers are not going to see it day to day. And so um, I Tract went. Tractivist says uh, he enjoyed the interview and, and thanks y'all. Oh, yeah. <laughs> thanks, Tractivist. Hey, thank you. Um, so I try to take every photo with a little bit offness. And, and in this photo, I was crying and laughing at the same time. It was hot. So this is your wedding that. photo, right? Yeah, it was only $37 for hair, makeup, Photoshop, photo session. That's not even my hair. You know, if you look closely here, there's uh, the wedding dress is is actually unstitched, which is fantastic. It's unstitched. Yeah, it's like coming apart. You should put. And it's actually hanging by. You don't want to Photoshop that out. By... No, they. I mean, they they <laughs> Photoshop it for you. They totally Photoshop it for you. So this is the wedding to yourself, right? Uh, no, I mean, I got married to myself like three years before that. So this is. Th it's these just, are just, just like glamour shots. They had a bunch of costumes, and I was like, you know. I was with three uh, gay men and it was the one studio that was willing to photo men in drag like many studios would not let men do drag and, this was uh, in Cambodia in Cambodia oh in Thailand it's not a big deal not Thailand but in mm -hmm. Cambodia they have issues with uh, at, le uh, at least I was told because this is the one place that would yeah. let us do it especially with the Apsara which is the goddess photos they didn't they don't want um, uh, men 
in drag because they don't want to yeah. mock. It's like a sacred figure. You don't want to like invite. Men are sacred sacred figures. No, no, no. The Apsara, the goddess. Oh, the Apsara. Just over there. Yeah, we'll we'll take a look at that in a second. <laughs> so anyway, um, yeah, let's yeah. move on to this this one here. That's just this another is just picture of painting. Sexy wedding photo. And this is when you got married to yourself. No, this are all. This is. I already been married to myself at this point. So, so this is. This These is are just, just a, pictures I took. This is just a glamour. Yeah. In, shot in Cambodia. And then this is from an artist. I can't remember his name. He's out of Tampa, or was out of Tampa. Uh, I won it in a silent auction. He does portraits of the people, the back of people's heads, and it, and uh, he had done this project where he gave everybody the same haircut and then photoed the back of their heads and it's sort of about like anonymousness and our hair and identity around the hair and um sorry it's sort of a theme it's called me me uh, crazies yeah so this is the trader bag drove trader joe <laughs> and so these are uh, the, this is the the one in cambodia right? yeah so this is the apsara so this is this gold bodysuit is actually uh uh the real in real life, it was just the woman was just naked, but they obviously can't do that. So, so we all took turns wearing that for the same costume, and it would be so sweaty. So they take it off, and they would just blow dry it, and oh. they would put it on the next. Wow! Person. And that's Isn't not that my hair. Kind of gross. It's not my hair. Yeah. But that's the magic of photos. Uh, okay, and this one. Uh, this one or yeah, this, this one? one? This one. This, this one. Um, this is uh, Angkor Wat. Photoshopped in the back, and wow, and I actually beautiful. took Cambodian dance in college, and and the legit Cambodian dancers can get their fingers like all the way back and curly, but this <laughs> this is my weak ass um, Cambodian dance hand. And then the one up there, uh, that's the closest to Christina face that I got to do. But I don't know. I think I guess it's another like statue image from Angkor Wat behind it. Yeah, and then and then uh, uh, these are um, Viva Van Story, who's a pinup photographer in uh, New Jersey. To, I, I took that I took uh, right before I turned thirty years old. Okay. Yeah. Can I show this one? Uh, this you can draw that one. Yeah, that one. We're gonna. <laughs> we'll come we'll we'll That is. Uh, we'll and that's another. You have to come. You have to be invited. That is from a Groupon. Yeah, that's a place in um, Eagle Rock that does photos. Okay. I'm gonna oh, don't worry, I'll, I'll crop <laughs> Just a closer shot. You look so cute. I I always, girl, always look cute. <laughs> okay. okay, so um, I'm going to flip the Here we are. Hey, guys, thanks for watching Amy Lou Presents, hashtag Amy Lou Presents. Uh, we'll be having some really interesting guests coming on soon. Um, I want to thank Christina Wong. I'm driving you crazy right now. Where's Christina Wong? Oh. <laughs> I want to thank Christina Wong for being our first headliner guest yeah. for uh, the Periscope show. And uh, 24 hours to tell your friends, and then we we go uh uh. <laughs> but I'm gonna I'm gonna upload it on uh, various social media, so don't so worry, you can forever. catch the replay. So yeah, again, Christina, um, Christ let me uh, let me flip the camera. So thank you so much, Christina. Any last words for your fans? Just show up at the Red Cat or I'll kill you. November 12th <laughs> through 15th, Red Wong Street Journal. Okay, we're done. This is a long interview. I love you, but this is a long interview. Yeah, okay. Thank you so much, everybody, for watching. We'll see you soon.